we're going to talk about the churches of Romanesque Burgundy in France. We're going to talk about the churches of St. Peter and Paul at Cluny, uh, usually just known as Saint-Pierre or St. Peter. The ch church of Saint-Lazare or St. Lazarus at Atan. And the church of Mary Magdalene, Santa Madeleine in Vézelay. First, we will talk about the monastery at E. Saint-Pierre Cluny was a Benedictine monastery. Uh, it was founded in 909 on land that was donated by Duke William of Aquitaine, and it grew to be the largest, most powerful, and extremely influential monastery in Europe. And this pertains to art as well as to church matters. It began with 70 monks who wished to follow the strict rule of St. Benedict. The duke waived his feudal rights, and the, du the monks were subject only to the pope. The Cluniac reform spread. They founded many new daughter houses. They reformed older monasteries, including St. Pierre at Moisac. And all of these daughter uh, houses answered to the abbot of Cluny, who was the central authority. And remember, the abbot of Cluny answers only to the pope, so he was extremely powerful. At Cluny, there's an emphasis on scholarly labor. It became the intellectual center of Western Europe and was especially known for its music and purity of liturgy. Architecturally, there were three successive churches, all dedicated to Saints Peter and Paul, and they're known as Cluny I, Cluny II, and Cluny III. We will emphasize the largest and most important, Cluny III. Abbot Berno, B-E-R-N-O, founded Cluny I. Um, we don't know too much about that church. Uh, it's said to be small, about 100 feet long, and barn-like, which presumably means that it was a very simple basilica. Uh, one of the uh, notable abbey, abbots uh, from uh, the uh, early 10th century was Abbot Odo, who was later canonized as Saint Odo, and he reigned as abbot from 927 to 942 or 44. He was a poet and musician. He set the psalms to music. He wrote a treatise on music called the Dialogus de Musica, he developed a system of musical notation, which is one of the earliest forms of writing down musical notes. Under his reign, uh, there was the expansion of the Cluniac reforms to daughter houses, including the reform of Monte Cassino in Italy, which is very important because Monte Cassino was the monastery founded by St. Benedict, and Western Mon it's the home of Western monasticism. Under abbots, and I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, M A Y E U L, Mayul, uh, 954 to, 940, uh, to 994, uh, Cluny II was erected, and uh, he was followed by Odilo, known as Saint Odila, from 994 to 1049. Odila is known as the empire builder of the Cluniac order. His successor was Abbot Hugh of Seymour, who became Saint Hugh, and he was the abbot from 1049 to 1109. During this period was the height of Cluny's political power. Uh, abbot Hugh mediated in imperial and papal disputes. One of his benefactors was King Alfonso VI of Castile. And at that time, there were 300 monks at Cluny, which is probably the largest monastery ever, or I shouldn't say ever, but in the Middle Ages. Uh, coming from Cluny were also popes, uh, people who trained at Cluny, who were Cluniac monks. Uh, pope Gregory VII, from ten, he was Pope from 1073 to 93, and he was known as Reformer Pope. And Urban II, 
who is the pope who preached the first crusade in 1095 and 1096. The Church of Cluny, well first let's talk about the Church of Cluny too, we're looking at right now. It was begun sometime between 940 and 960, so I just put a circa 950 date there, and it was dedicated in 981. Uh, what you see is essentially it looks uh, you know, sort of those, a simple basilica with embellishments. Uh, so basically you have a basilica church, uh, longitudinal, with a transept, side aisle on either side. And there are several notable features about this. One is that it has an elongated apse. And you'll see this fairly frequently in mon monastery churches because they need to have extra room for the monks. And of course, it is in uh, the extended apse or the choir, uh, which is where the monks, the choir of monks, they would say. That's not necessarily singing, although here they did chant, the Gregorian chant. Uh, and so here they are uh, seated in this elongated apse. And you'll see that there's one large apse with uh, two smaller ones uh, on either side. Uh, and then you have a transept. And then at the western end, the entrance end, uh, you have a two-tower facade uh, that is uh, fairly elaborate. And this is, comes to be called the Galilee Porch. But it's Clooney III that we really want to emphasize, because this becomes the largest monastery in Christendom, the largest monastery, and not just the largest monastery, excuse me, the largest church in the world from when it was erected, uh, the late 11th, early 12th century, up until the erection of the new Church of St. Peter's, which of course is the present church that was erected during the 16th and 17th century. Uh, so this is a very important church. And it all comes down to a dream. At least that's the story. That uh, Gunzo, who was an old paralyzed monk, uh, he's in the infirmary, and he has a dream. And in the dream, St. Peter commands him uh, to tell the, uh, the uh, monastery's abbot, who is St. Hugh, that he must build a new church. And Peter says that if Gonzo fails to do this, uh, well, he says if, if Gonzo does this, Gonzo will be cured of his paralysis. But if Hugh fails to build the church, Hugh will be stuck, struck down with Gonzo's illness. Now, whether that's exactly what happened or not, we don't know, but that is the story as recorded. Um, the person who we think may have designed Cluny uh, was a canon, uh, Hizelo, or Hizelo, uh, who uh, was a mathematician. Which we don't know exactly, uh, but uh, that's the theory anyway. Now, most of Cluny, as large and powerful it was, most of it has been destroyed. Uh, it was demolished at the time of the French Revolution. It was literally sold uh, for building blocks and torn down for construction material. The only thing that survives of the architecture is the south transept, which you're looking at here. Uh, including the tower of the south transept. But if you look at this image, you will see that it once was part of a very uh, large and powerful monastery. And we talked about monasteries before. Uh, the idea that you need to have uh, a self-sufficient monastery. And of course, this, this one was very, very powerful and very, very large. Uh, they owned tremendous lands. Uh, serfs worked the lands for them. The monks went about their scholarly labors. Um, and of course, there were all of these things, as you can see, uh, that are needed. Uh, the church, very large church, the cloister, the refectory, uh, and of course, uh, infirmaries, uh, places to 
create goods. Uh, we do have, because it was torn down uh, near the end of the 18th century, uh, and so people had done some drawings of it. So we do have some drawings of it as well as uh, the writings from the Middle Ages and uh, archaeological uh, studies. Uh, so that's one of the plays where they're able to reconstruct this building. You see one of the drawings here, and you see the model that's been reconstructed. If we look at the plan and another reconstruction, people do seem to like to make models of this, uh, we see that it is a very large and elaborate church. It has double side aisles. In other words, uh, you have your nave in the center, two aisles on one side, two aisles on another. We saw that at uh, St. Sernin in Toulouse. And there's just extra room, and remember how large this monastery was. We also have double transepts. Uh, there's one very large transept, and then a smaller one, which is right up there near the choir, or the apse end, the east end. Uh, and when you look down at your model, it, it almost seems to become part of this very elaborate uh, apse end, choir end. Um, there are echelon chapels, or chapels that are uh, perpendicular to the um, transept, and they open into the transept, and they're all parallel, hence echelon. And of course, there are radiating chapels coming out of the choir, so very elaborate east end. Uh, this was indeed the largest church in Christendom until the building of New St. Peter's in the Vatican, which was built in the 16th and 17th century. Here you see another one of these drawings on the right, and the reconstruction. And I, I was going to try to see which one's the clearest, in some ways one or the other, but let's look at this and see some of the features of the nave of Cluny, uh, Cluny three. The nave has, uh, it's very, very tall, and it has a three-part elevation. That means that you have, when you look at the wall, you have these openings at three levels, three stories, as it were, but three levels, really. Uh, you have the nave arcade, a triforium, and the Clare story. When you look at this, you have uh, the nave arcade, which, notice that it's pointed arches. We're going to talk about that. The arches are actually pointed. Then we have a triforium in the center. Remember that we used to talk about the gallery when we looked at uh, some of the other churches, uh, at St. Uh, Santiago and uh, St. Sernin at Toulouse. We said that there was a gallery above the arcade. And what's the difference between a triforium and a gallery? Well, a gallery is larger. You can walk around in it. In fact, it's intended to be a kind of second story. A triforium is much smaller. Yes, there's a place to get up and walk around it, but it's not really intended for people to mill around. It's a much smaller area. Uh, and it really serves the purpose of sort of hiding the fact uh, that you've got some architecture there. You have it open because of the uh, arches in the triforium, but then there's a wall behind it. Uh, so it's sort of hiding the fact that there's a wall there. It makes it appear to be much more open. So the triforium essentially is smaller than a gallery. And then you have the clear story level, or the window level, which is right up at the top. And you'll remember at St. Sarnan, there was no clear story. It was very dark. But here you do have a clear story level to let in more light. Now, I really want to emphasize this three-part elevation and the fact that it has pointed arches. Because not only was Cluny very influential on other Cluniac and other churches uh, in the Romanesque period, but it was also very influential on the nave elevation of Gothic churches. Because this three-part elevation is exactly what we see in Gothic churches. 
Uh, the difference, of course, is that the Gothic churches' uh, Claire stories become much larger. But this is this is the origin, and it is very interesting when we're going to look at Gothic later on. Um, it's worthwhile thinking about where did they get these things? Because they didn't just spring up instantly. Uh, you take things like the pointed arches from Cluny, uh, two tower facades, which we see a number of places. Um, we'll be seeing it at Khan, for example, uh, or at Cluny itself. Uh, all of the elements that we call Gothic are developed out of uh, construction de uh, developments, learning to do uh, different things with the masonry uh, that we see in earlier churches. And because Cluny was the largest one, uh, they had to develop some new ways to erect a very, very large building. And one of these was the beginning of the pointed arches. Even the nave vault is just slightly pointed. Uh, in this particular reconstruction, it's, it's, it doesn't look it. Uh, but if you think back to the drawing we saw a minute ago, just slightly pointed. But it's very clear that the nave arcades were pointed arches. Uh, and to give you another view of that, uh, you see this reconstruction of just one bay uh, where you can see your tall pointed arch the arcade, and then uh, the Triforium level, and then a Claire Story level, and then you have the springing of the vault. Uh, over there you see what a compound pier looks like if you could sort of slice it in the middle. Uh, you've got this very, very heavy support uh, with a lot of articulation, a lot of, uh, I would say, fancy things attached to it. Shafts, half columns, uh, that just make it more complex, more visually interesting, and add support. Just some more examples of what is actually surviving is the tr south, south transept. Uh, which is the actual surviving part of the church. Uh, it's not exactly identical, uh, but here you can see uh, that you do have a triforium, which is really is a blind arches. It's, it's not uh, as, as open as other triforiums might be. And uh, looking up into uh, kind of an octagonal dome uh, in that tower. Although the church was uh, torn down, and we do not have the tympana. Uh, we are able to do some reconstructions of it. And there are fragments of sculpture which have survived. So I'll be showing you some of those. Uh, the artist, the sculptor, we don't know his name. Uh, we can call him the Clooney Master, and he seems to have been very influential. Uh, some of works that seem to be by his hand are also found at Vézelay in the uh, nave capitals not the tympana there, but the capitals. And uh, one of the assistants, uh, at least we assume he was an assistant, one of the hands, as we say, uh, when we see a particular artist's style, uh, we'll say it's the hand of the artist. We're saying it's by that artist. Uh, so we see the hand of an artist, which we later see at another church, at a ton. And in that case, the uh, sculptor has actually recorded his name. He carved it into the tympana. And so we know that his name is Giselbertus. So he was probably first an assistant uh, to the master at Cluny. As you look at this reconstruction, you can see that what we, we have is a Christ in the center, uh, the kind of iconography that we call Christ in glory, the apocalyptic Christ, or the uh, majesty of the Lord. Christ in majesty, all pretty much referring to the same thing, Christ in heaven. Uh, he's seated on a, uh, in the middle of a large oval halo that completely surrounds his entire body. Uh, we know that it's Christ because he has a nimmed halo or a halo uh, with a cross in it. And uh, you've already seen images of this uh, with him holding the book, blessing with the other hand. We think there was an apps uh, painting and the Conch of the Apse that was very similar to this, uh, with the majesty of the Lord there as well. Uh, on either side, we have angels uh, who are on clouds. And up in what, uh, can we call it corners when it doesn't have corners? <laughs> uh, we have the four evangelist symbols. Uh, the eagle, the angel, or winged man, 
the ox, and the lion. We think that uh, the tympana at a smaller abbey, the abbey at Charlou, was probably based on the tympana at uh, Cluny, but it is certainly much simplified. Uh, you've just got Christ and the two angels, and then of course you have apostles down there below in the lintel. One of the largest surviving fragments is found in the Rhode Island School of Design Museum of Art. And this is really a wonderful piece. <laughs> uh, this is St. Peter. He probably was in the spandrels uh, or the uh, sort of the corners that are above the lunette. Um, and uh, let's take a look at his style. Uh, we have a figure which has uh, a really a lot of interest to it. Uh, he's uh, got this uh, wonderfully detailed beard and uh, hair that is formed by grooves, just sort of carving ridges into the, uh, uh, or carving grooves that leave ridges uh, into the stone. Uh, little curly cues, as you can see at the end of his, uh, his hair. Uh, very giant, huge key. And that's to identify him. We'll know he is St. Peter because he is carrying the keys. Uh, Peter is supposed to have been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven by Christ. And uh, they're made extra large so you can see them uh, when he's up there in the spandrels and you're down there on the ground looking up. Uh, remember also, all of these churches were painted. So the sculpture was painted probably with pretty bright colors so you could really pick out details. I think it's really interesting to look at the way the draperies are carved. And he uses a really interesting technique. It almost looks like an armadillo or uh, plates that overlap. If you look at uh, the, uh, the area over the chest and then sort of reversed uh, over the arm. And then, of course, there are, there are details like these little uh, circles that are carved to be uh, decoration around the collar. And we'll see some techniques like this uh, in other uh, Burgundian Romanesque sculptures. Just quickly, there are a number of capitals that survive. Uh, I don't think I'm going to list them all. I've got a list of them uh, in the notes that I've put up there. Uh, but these are some that I just had uh, found pictures of. One is narrative. It uh, may be the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, Abraham being almost completely broken off. Uh, Looks like uh, Isaac looks more like he's seated on a little chair than on a altar, but presumably that's what's going on. He doesn't look very upset about what's happening. And then there's the angel coming in, of course, to stop uh, the sacrifice. So uh, at least that's how that that has been interpreted. Um, the figure over here, you know, sort of reminds you, in a sense, of the Roman river gods. You've got a personification, although there's no terrible, no great interest or understanding of anatomy. Um, and you have this river flowing down uh, and uh, foliage uh, carved growing up. Uh, very abstracted, very pattern-like, uh, and really, uh, I guess, you know, extremely charming. Don't try to apply Renaissance classical standards to Romanesque sculpture. You'll just get in trouble. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, just don't do that. <laughs> uh, look at it for what it is and uh, enjoy. Uh, yeah, there are some questions about what these things represent. And this is usually considered to be a river of paradise. Uh, but there's probably other ways that uh, people have interpreted. A number of, uh, there are some that seem to be virtues. Let me see our, uh, Presumably, presumably the personification of a virtue over there, the little lady with the, the uh, draperies that seem to flutter at the ham. And uh, also there's a number that seem to refer to music. Uh, and they have been considered to be the tones of the plain song, the Gregorian chant. Although I think that's kind of interesting because they're all the figures uh, that we associate with music are showing musical instruments. And you can see uh, one of the figures here. Um, and of course, plain song is music without accompaniment. It doesn't have musical instruments. 
Uh, so I'm not quite sure what to make out of that. Maybe it's just how would you show music uh, except by showing musical instruments. And just to do that, just to show music. Remember how important music uh, for uh, Cluny. Um, you know, just to show music is innovative. So here we see uh, some of the figures. They're supposed to be musical tones uh, on the capitals of the columns. They're not sure where all these capitals were. They're not sure if they were all in the same place, if some were in the nave, if some were uh, around the uh, uh, the apse. And uh, there are a number of reconstructions about that. Uh, they're very energetic little figures. They've usually got uh, fairly large hands uh, and uh, can gesture. They twist. So you get a really a wonderful feeling of movement. Uh, the draperies sometimes uh, uh, move away from the body. Uh, and they all seem to be in these uh, mandorlas with uh, inscriptions on them. One of the problems is that it's possible to, to remove the sculpture and so they don't know if some of them have been switched, and they're certainly missing um, capitals. Uh, so reconstructing it is uh, one of those weighty problems that I'm not undertaking.